Well, last week we looked at the Lord's Prayer, the prayer he prayed just before he went to the cross in John chapter 17. Uh, one of my favorite chapters of the Bible. And uh, today I want to shift from the Lord's Prayer to one of the prayers that Paul prayed for the church. And I have a clear objective today, and that is for us to learn four ways today that we can pray for our church and for the individuals in our church. So my hope is that with the notes you have in front of you and when the church is over and when you go home, this might be one of those you won't throw away. That you'll say, wait a minute, here's a guide for me to know how to pray for others in our church. Paul lists his prayer in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning with verse 15. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, to which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, I want you to know, uh, my son was proofing what I write for you all to look at, because you know how bad I am about not writing it, right? And at the last part of that is what he told me was a run-on sentence. Now, here's what I want you to know. That's very biblical. Because every bit of this that I just read to you was one sentence in Paul's mind. There's no breaks. So I'm in good company with the Apostle Paul when you see my run-on sentences. First, I want you to notice Paul's motivation for what led him to pray for the church. He says, for this reason, I'm praying. Now, he's looking back at what you will find from the verses before this, which, by the way, is another run-on sentence, all the way a bit of it. And in that, he's celebrating, as he looks back at all the spiritual blessings that the church has received from the Lord. Later, you can go back and read the first part of this, and you will find that it includes our election, our predestination, our adoption, the grace from God, redemption, forgiveness, wisdom, understanding, knowledge, all in the mystery of the will, being sealed by the Holy Spirit, and their inheritance. And because of their position in the Lord, he's now motivated to pray for them. Now, the actual motivation for praying for them came from two things that he had heard about how they were living. What happened? Oh, oh. he had heard two things about how they were living. He had heard of their faith in the Lord Jesus and their love toward all the saints. These two pillars stand side by side in Christ-like living. One cannot claim to have faith in the Lord Jesus and not have love for all the saints. And one cannot have genuine love for all the saints without having experienced faith in the Lord Jesus. Notice that Paul did not just say, because of your faith. 
No, he said, because of your faith in the Lord Jesus. You see, faith must have an object. You're driving down the road, there's a car coming toward you, and you're placing your faith in that person driving to stay on their side of the road. There's an object to your faith, no matter what it is. We live by faith all the time. You go to a restaurant maybe today, and you eat food, trusting in the cooks back there that they didn't get mad and spit in it. By faith, you eat. Faith must have an object. Notice that Paul points out the object of our faith. He's speaking of faith, the kind of faith in the Lord Jesus, that is a channel through which Jesus brings us salvation and eternal life. Later he will express it succinctly in chapter 2, verse 8, when he says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Now, been around me long enough, you might remember that grace, in Paul's definition, is God coming to you in Christ. Because in chapter 1, before what we're reading now, over and over again, he says, in Christ you have forgiveness. In Christ you have faith. In Christ you have salvation. In Christ, in Christ, in Christ. He said the phrase in Christ 167 times. It's one of his favorite phrases. He's a Jesus freak, okay? It's all in Christ. And so, when he says by grace, all of a sudden, he's saying, by God coming to you in Christ, you have been saved. And then look, the channel is through faith. You see, the object of our faith must be the Lord Jesus. We're not told to believe in a creed, to believe in the church, to believe in other Christians. Saving faith is in the risen, exalted Christ who sits at the right hand of God. Their faith in the Lord Jesus brought the miracle of salvation to their lives. But their love for the saints demonstrated the transforming reality of that conversion. In other words, you can see faith. Their faith in Christ showed up by their love for the other believers. So here again, faith and love must go hand in hand. Genuine faith is always expressed by genuine faith love. It's interesting to note that Paul ended this letter with the same emphasis that he began with. Now I want you to look how he ended this letter, Ephesians 6, 23. Peace be with you, brothers, and love with faith from God the Father, Lord Jesus Christ. See how he binds those two together? Because they are so bound up in what it is to live the Christ-like life. Paul then makes four specific prayer requests for the church. He prays first that God may give them the ability to know him personally and fully. He says, I pray that God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. As believers, they already had the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. His prayer, Paul's prayer, is that they might be receptive to allowing God to deepen that understanding of God. The goal is to have the knowledge of God deepened in their minds and hearts. The hearts would be made to see. I love the phrase that you might be able to see the eyes of your heart. The eyes of your heart. I see to see. That is to be enlightened to knowing God more clearly. Now, this, again, is the idea of knowing God in an intimate, personal way, as we spoke of last week when Jesus said in John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And I told you last week, the word know there is a word of deep intimacy. So here again, he says, I want you to be enlightened that you might have the knowing or the knowledge. Paul wants the church to have wisdom in the knowledge of God, as well as revelation in the knowledge of God. He, the revelation deals with the imparting of knowledge. I want it to be revealed to you. I want you to be able to understand what it means to know God. And then wisdom is how do you carry out the life of knowing God. The apostle is not thinking about knowledge here in general. It's very specific knowledge to him. He wants the believers to have a deep spiritual an experiential knowing of God, a knowledge that cannot be gained by intellectual ability, 
but only by the gracious ministry of the Holy Spirit. Wisdom and revelation from the Holy Spirit must happen first before the next three that he prayed for can take place in our life. There's four things total, but this one is the foundation. Having a genuine relational knowing of the Lord must happen before we can move forward. And that's why the next four phrases that he has starts with, that you may know. The eyes of your heart be enlightened, that you may know. And then I want you to notice this. Then he has the word what three times. What is the hope? What is the riches? What is the power? So this is a preacher's paradise. You see, Paul was a preacher. He, he was a very logical. He laid out things in one, two, threes. And here, if you're trying to find three points for a sermon, Paul gave them to me right there. There's three what's. The first thing he says, I want you to know, is what is the hope? Then he says, I want you to know what are the riches? And then I want you to know what is the greatness of what? What is the hope of your calling? What is the riches of your inheritance? And what is the greatness of the power of God? So he's laid out these simple one, two, three. And that's what we're going to look at for the rest of the time. Is these three other desires and things that he prays for for the church. So as you're listening to this, I want you to be thinking about how can I hone my prayer life in for this church and for bodies of believers to encompass these aspects of prayer. First, I pray that everyone might come to a personal knowing experience in their life with the Lord Jesus. And then I pray that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. Hope in the scripture is never means wishful thinking. You know, like, I hope it doesn't rain today because I want to play golf or whatever. I hope it's warmer than it's supposed to be because I want to go fishing. Whatever. Hope is not wishful thinking. Hope is a certainty that lies ahead of the future. Hope in the Bible is always a futuristic desire for something you know God can do and will do. So, in this case, the hope is the hope of our calling. The hope of our calling, first and foremost, is the hope of our eternal destiny. That is the hope of eternal life. We live in the, not wishful thinking, but in the hope that we will live with God forever. Jesus defined eternal life again, as I reminded you, of knowing the Father and knowing the Son. Our hope is that and then that lasts throughout eternity. And so that intimate personal life is what we live. We live in the hope of that. This hope brings us our salvation and extends throughout eternity. Paul then speaks, oh, also in, in Romans 1.6, he speaks of one who is called to belong to Christ Jesus. So part of the hope in our calling is that we've been called to belong to Christ. Christ owns you. You belong to him. We belong to Christ. Paul reminds Timothy of a God who saved us and called us to a holy calling. He says it's not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the age began. So we have a holy calling. What's the purpose that that includes? The purpose includes a calling to be like Jesus. Romans 8, 29, the following says, For those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he has predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, when we talk about we've been predestined, this scripture tells us clearly what the predestination is. We've been predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. In other words, we've been predestined by God that we would talk and walk and act in a way that people see Jesus in us. 
This is our holy calling. Remember, the Bible says that believers were first called Christians at Antioch. Now, they called themselves the way prior to this. <clears throat> they were called Christians. Not they named themselves Christians. But the lost world saw them acting like that Christ fella, and they, so they called them little Christ. That's what Christian means. It was a mockery to which the Christians took upon themselves as a badge of glory. Oh, you see Jesus in me. I'll claim that. So this holy calling is that we be conformed in such a way that people see Jesus in us. So, uh, notice the progression here of all this. God foreknew, predestined, called, justified, and ultimately glorified us. The end of all of this is our life in Christ with a new glorified existence. That's what glorified means, brought to the new state of glorification. Now, all this hope that we have, the hope of eternal life, the hope of that new walk is all in Christ. That's why Paul said that God has now revealed to us in Colossians 1.27 the mystery, a mystery. And what is that mystery? He says, the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, of glorification, the hope of the future in Christ. So, That's a lot, that we live in the hope. What should be our response to this calling? Well, he later says in chapter 4 of Ephesians, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. All of that is a way we walk worthy of the hope to which we've been called. Now, if you look at that, you might have a different area of struggle than someone else to maintain that walk. I know some of us have to deal with bearing with one another in love as one of our main challenges. In other words, you put up with other people's weirdness. You put up with people who you don't understand, the way they talk, the way they act. You're talking about believers. How many of you all know that you are called to love everyone in this church, but you were not called to like everyone in this church? Did you know that? You don't even have to like your pastor. Be nice for me if you did. But love is a commitment to do actions of care. Like is an emotion of feeling that you cannot control. You either have it or you don't. And you, if you're honest, will say, you like some people in our church more than you like others. That's natural. It's because we have different personalities. We have different ways we relate. So it's natural that certain folk you're drawn to a natural, I like to be with this person. You, you know who you like, don't you? You like people who make you like yourself. That's who you like. You know, you like people who when you're around them, you feel good about yourself. I'm just telling you how it is, a bit, little psychology here. This is free, it's not in my notes. Just it's in my head. But you like people who make you like yourself. That's natural. Others, you Love them by putting up with their weirdness. It's okay. And guess what happens? Sometimes when you learn to put up with someone, then you learn to understand them better. Guess what can happen? You might actually start liking them. You never know. That's kind of how it works. But all this challenge of walking worthy, and there are other passages of other descriptions of what it means to walk worthy, what I'm thinking we might be looking at in the near future, of other worthy ways to walk. But in this area... He's talking about the heart of it, the humility, the gentleness, the patience. All of this is how our response is to be the fact that we were called to a holy calling. We live in the hope of the calling, and we express the hope of the calling by how we relate.
to other brothers and sisters. Now, the next part that Paul wants you to know that he prays for the church about, that I think it wouldn't hurt for us to pray about, is that you may know, got to have knowledge of it, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Paul first mentions our inheritance in verse 11. He says, in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of his will, who works in all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. So there is this obtaining of the inheritance. And Paul says earlier that it's because we are now God's children by adoption that we have an inheritance. In verse 5 of chapter 1, he says, He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. J. Vernon McGee puts it this way. He says, this is a marvelous truth. God gives us an inheritance. He rewards us for something that we have not done. It is, not, it is the overall purpose and plan of God that believers should have a part in Christ's inheritance. They are going to inherit with Christ because they are in Christ. A verse that describes that even more clearly is Romans 8, 16. The spirit of himself bears witness with our spirit that we are God's children, or the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, providing we suffer with him in order that he might be glorified in him. We might be glorified in him. Now, Try to wrap your mind around this. We are in the inheritance of God because we've been adopted. I want you to wrap your mind around the adopted word. Just to remind you, I've seen situations in America where someone has adopted a child and through the law and the systems, they ended up losing the child even after having adopted the child. Right? That never happened in the culture to which this was written. In this culture, an adopted child was considered more connected to the parents than a birth child. In this culture, a parent could leave their birth child out of their will, but they could not leave their adopted child out of their will. It was a sense of permanency that we don't have comprehension of in our society. So when he says we're adopted as his children, there's a big meaning about that from God's perspective. And because we're adopted, Jesus, now hang on, he is also our brother. And whatever the father has chosen to give the son, he's chosen to give his sons and daughters with them because we've been adopted. This is the love of God toward us. Wrap your mind around this. He gives us the same things he gives his son, his complete love. Through his son, the experience of redemption. Through his son, the forgiveness of sins that his son paid for, we get because his son gained it. Through his son, he gives us resurrection of the dead. Through his son, we inherit eternal life. Through his son, we internal, inherit eternal life that is literally in the presence of God where his son is now. Through his son, we have ultimate glorification, and the list goes on and on and on. One place says the eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, all that God has in store for us who are in Christ Jesus, and it's all because we're fellow heirs through adoption. Now, put your mind around how much God really loves you when you hear all that. In short, well, let me give you one more verse. Because there's another way of looking at this. Not only do we have an inheritance, but God sees us as his inheritance. I'm just going to show you one passage here in 1 Peter. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own possession, 
that you may proclaim the excellence of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So he's brought us into his fold. So in short, and there are other passages, but we have a full inheritance as co-heirs, and God rejoices in us as his heirs. The final thing Paul wants us as believers to know is to know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. And the rest of this passage is describing that. So I want to break it down for you a little bit. You see, Paul wants us to understand the power which is working in us who are children of God. To emphasize this greatness of this power, Paul stacks words upon words. I want you to see how he stacks these words to describe the power. He says, I want you to know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power. Stacking words on, not just power, immeasurable greatness. You can't measure how great God's power is toward we. Got that? Then he says, the power that is working is of a great power. It is the working of his great might. Both the word great and the word might, adding to the words of immeasurable greatness. And the word working even carries the idea of, of power. This power is the same power. Also, he says that raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at the right hand in heavenly places. And that power is working in you and me. Resurrection power is working in you and me. This power places Jesus not just above everyone. I want you to look at this. But far above. Far above who? Any other power ever known or that will ever be known. Far above rule and authority and power and dominion, stacking words on here, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come, you can't name a power that God's not more powerful. Stacking on words. This power subjugates every other power. It's not just everything else is placed under him. It's placed under his feet. And that he put all things under his feet and gave him head over all things of the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fulfills all in all. Now that's power. Name any power, it's under the feet of Jesus. You can't get any lower. See, the church is described here as his body, which encompasses all things. And with such a head as this, what need does this church have? What need do we have to fear? What need do we have that he can't supply the want of? So, this is the power we celebrate. Now, whether or not you're feeling that power doesn't change the fact that that power is there for you and me. Okay? You got to deal with truth before you worry about experience. He says this power is there for you. We celebrate this power. As children of God, we who are willing to place ourselves under the feet of the Lord, that's where we're going to place ourselves, under the feet of the Lord and the Savior, we can live in confidence. We can walk in a personal relationship with Jesus, knowing the hope we have in our calling. Rejoicing in ours and his glorious inheritance while experiencing this resurrection power day by day. Four things to pray for the church. We're going to take just a couple of minutes, and you can begin now by praying for God's people in such a way.
Father, it could be that some of us need to pray that we personally will experience these fresh in our life before we can even be led to pray that others would. And I pray, God, right now that each of us might grasp more the knowledge of knowing you personally and fully, that we might know and live in that absolute confidence of the hope to which you called us so that we might grasp that calling. I pray that we might know and get a hold of the riches of the inheritance that what you have established for us in our future is beyond words and beyond our understanding. But Lord, we need to live in the joy of that. And I pray, Lord, that we might know how great you really are and that we might live without fear. We might live in trust with you day by day that we would live worthy of your calling. In Christ's name, amen. Let's worship in song.